All right. Well, with that, let me welcome everyone here joining us this evening, um, or wherever you are in the world, joining us at this moment for a webinar on parrot rehab and rewilding a conservation success story in Belize, presented by SIN with Belize Bird Rescue. Uh, we are so thrilled to have Nikki with us. Uh, in fact, we've been chatting with her for a number of months about this, and it's just so exciting to see this come to fruition. Uh, for just a little background, I'll, I'll give a, a few moments uh, of, of consideration on why this is exciting and interesting to us at Nurture Nature Campaign, and then we'll hand things over to Nikki and she'll jump into this uh, excellent story to tell. So by way of a quick introduction, we are the Nurture Nature Campaign based out of Trinidad and Tobago. And our goal is to end the harmful and often illegal pet wildlife trade. And that is in Trinidad and Tobago and in the wider Southern Caribbean. And part of that is delivering a, a educational webinars, hoping to cover issues to raise awareness of the problem and then uh, my personal favorite is talking about some of the solutions to the pet wildlife trade. Uh, and most of all, if you think about today, it's, it's about closing the loop, right? There are so many animals that enter the trade and they need to go somewhere. It, they, they should not, in many cases, remain at homes. And uh, ideally, they would not just sit in cages the rest of lives because they're wild animals and they deserve to be free. And that's what and rewilding, as we'll come to discuss what that means, uh, that's, that just plays an essential role in connecting that, that, that cycle. So just for a few moments of consideration, uh, why is rehab and rewilding important? So, of course, all animals have an important role in the ecosystem. And taking them out for something like a pet trade can be devastating to ecosystems and, of course, animal welfare. These, by nature, being wild, they're not meant to be in homes. They are wild animals with wild instincts and many needs that are not just easily met by, by ordinary persons in homes and residences. Beyond the pet trade, we know that wildlife is also harmed in many other ways, in many other interactions with humans. Of course, farmers, we often are aware, will treat wildlife as pests. Hunters, beyond trapping for pets, will of course do what they do and hunt for meat. And then you have the encroachment of human society into wild spaces, leading to all sorts of harmful interactions. Dogs, cats, in fact, cats are, have a tremendous impact on wildlife, cars, electrical wires, and so much more can cause yet more injuries to wildlife. And at the end of the day, we want to be able to help these injured animals and have them rehabilitated and put back into the wild. There's many definitions of rewilding. In this case, we might consider rewilding to be the process of teaching a longtime captive animal to return to their forest home. And that's learning how to be a wild animal. They still have their instincts, but it doesn't mean that they have some lessons still to learn. So learning how to avoid human threat, predators, if they've been desensitized to that, flying and foraging, many birds in cages, for instance, will have atrophied wings and unable to fly long distances. And then just learning how to socialize with other members of their species. All this is important. So that's where we think about rehab and rewilding not just for the pet wildlife trade, but all sorts of human interactions with wildlife. When we think about rehabilitated wilding in Trinidad and Tobago, what do we know? Well, there's some policies. Oh, there, there's some policies. Uh, we do know that animals are confiscated out of the wildlife trade, and they would be sent to Emperor Valley Zoo. Uh, it's not a very transparent process, but we do understand a limited amount of rehabilitation occurs there. Um, beyond the zoo, however, injured animals and, pre and captive animals that, say, a family is no longer able to care for 
can donate those animals to rehab centers. And we know that there are in fact uh, eight or more rehab centers for individuals specializing in rehab in Trinidad and Tobago. We are very fortunate to count uh, among our Nurture Nature Coalition at, at least three of these um, and sometimes maybe more in a sort of more diffuse network manner. But in general, we would say El Socorro Center for Wildlife Conservation in Trinidad and we have Corbin Local Wildlife in Tobago and also Venus Doggess of Love in Tobago, one of my favorite named NGOs in the country. And Venus sometimes specializes in taking care of wildlife. Unfortunately, in spite of all the good efforts of, of and, and good intentions of rehabbers in this country, it is still plagued by a lack of funding and a lack of capacity in turn for rewilding. So we do see a lot of care for injured animals, things that have been, an os maybe an osprey that has been electrocuted, which is a recent case at El Socorro. But rewilding, many of the, say, parrots that are kept and no longer able to be cared for, or rewilding of monkeys that have spent several years in captivity, we don't yet have capacity for putting these animals back in the wild. And we hope to see that one day. So with that, in that context, I'm very, very pleased to introduce today, Nikki Buxton. Uh, she is the founder and director of Belize Bird Rescue, established in 2004. Uh, Belize, uh, Nikki and Belize Bird Rescue offers a very inspiring story in that um, it is the only multi-species avian rehab center in Belize. Belize is a slightly larger country than Trinidad and Tobago, but smaller in population. And when we think of this is in a matter of a little less than 20 years, uh, Nikki and her organization have been part of a, of a substantial change in how wildlife rehabilitation, even rewilding occurs. It's a future that I hope we can consider for Trinidad and Tobago. And that's where we are today to, to consider this story and hopefully imagine another story like it here in this country. So with that, Nikki, let me hand this over to you. Thank you for so much for letting me give a few remarks here. And um, I, will, I will stop my video and save us a little bandwidth and uh, away we go. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Nice introduction. And uh, thank you for hosting us here. Um, it's, it's great to be able to spread news of what we're doing and hopefully, you know, pass on the baton as it were. So, um, Belize, a lot of people think um, Belize is actually an island. It's not. It's, um, it's nestling on the edge of uh, Central America there, as you can see, with Guatemala and Mexico bordering. And it's, it's, it's quite a large area, but it has, as Mark said, a very small number of people. And it's actually the lowest population density in Central America, which is fantastic in that we have up to 37% protected areas in, in the country, um, which is, is a beautiful thing, except for the fact that now what we're seeing is increasing populations, increasing encroachment on the habitat and increasing agriculture, which is all part of the natural progression of, of humans, I guess. Um, my partner Jerry and I actually were in Trinidad for a long time and we were looking for somewhere that felt similar because we love Trinidad so much and we ended up in Belize and there's a lot of parallels which uh, which we enjoyed which we enjoyed especially the English speaking side of things because I do love to talk and it's it's very hard for me to learn a new language because I'm very old. <laughs> um, as the slide says tourism is an important sector of the economy and along with that goes the, um, the fact that Belize has a bunch of birds. We've got like 580 plus species. We're still discovering more species that occupy the territories as migrants or as endemic and um, we are marketing ourselves as a birding nation. We absolutely love our birding and our birders are like rock stars here. So that's uh, that's kind of a very much a growing industry here. So um, Mark's driving the, the desk for me. So next slide, Mark, please. So we're talking about um, the major threats. The threats that we face here to the bird species really similar to the, the ones in Trinidad. Um, we 
uh, historically, birds were kept captive for forever, ever since uh, the territories were occupied by the Spanish, the English, whatever. It's been a, a cultural acceptance to have a parrot in the cage in a house. And when we arrived in Belize, that's what we were witnessing, a tiny little cage with a bird inside hung from the veranda. Um, the, the phrase there results in abuse, neglect, mortality. It's, it's kind of not abuse so much as um, neglect through ignorance, which is what we found more than anything. Um, and, and that was one of our goals originally when we first came here to, to try and stamp out that. Uh, the citrus and corn crops are very prevalent here, and we're also getting more agriculture cre creeping in with um, cane fields and um, uh, other citrus crops, coconuts and stuff. And many birds are being persecuted for that, particularly things like woodpeckers and jays who use the, the crop to harvest their bugs. They'll pick a little hole in the citrus in every single citrus on the tree and then come back and harvest the bugs later. So they're getting killed as pests on a regular basis here. The parrot tamales thing is a new thing that's come in recently with a lot more immigration from Central America, which is absolutely horrifying and completely ridiculous because hardly any meat on parrots for sure. Um, and alongside that, yes, the increasing agriculture with habitat destruction and everything, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's a natural progression, as I said, but it's not, it's not a pleasant thing to watch. Oh, next slide. So we actually work with every single bird species, as Mark said, we're the only one, the only rescue center in the, in the country that caters for every single uh, species in the country. We have a, there's a raptor rescue that does some um, raptor rehab. And then there's a, a center on San Pedro, which caters for the, the keys with wildlife rescue out there. But they, we're the only ones doing parrots for sure, because it's such a specialized thing to have to do. And the challenges that come with multi-species, as, as many of you, if you do have a rescue center of hearing, you probably already know that we've got so many different diets. We have to raise rats, we have to raise chicks, we have to um, make sure that the habitat is correct for them, that the rehabilitation process itself is safe and appropriate, that we have the correct husbandry and, and release sites. Release sites are a problem as well because not every bird can be released on property. So that brings a whole bunch of challenges as well and, and, and definitely sucks on the resources of the center. Next slide. So the one bird that we concentrate most on is the uh, yellow-headed parrot, Amazona oratrix belizensis. This is an endangered subspecies that is endemic to Belize. And the reason why we work with this so much is um, highly sought after for the pet trade. And they nest in the pine savanna. So they're very, very easy to watch. You know, sorry, the poachers are very, very easy to see with uh, poachers. You've got this beautiful flat savanna with a great big pine tree in the distance and a yellow head sticking out the hole. They're also kind of loyal to their nest sites. So that makes it um, even more um, easy for the poachers to go in like week after week, year after year to, to go to the same nest and, um, and pick up birds. I'm sorry, my phone keeps ringing. I'm gonna put it in the drawer. <laughs> there you are, it's gone. <laughs> um, the, uh, the bird has recently been classified as critically endangered in this area because there's fewer than 1600 left in the country. They did a survey recently in 2016. And as a result, we've been working with the at-risk chicks where the rangers will pull um, of the four eggs that hatch, probably only two of them will ever survive. So they pull the remaining two chicks, the small ones and bring them to us and we hand raise them and take them back to the release site the following year. And over time we've put back um, 108, I think, of the yellowhead chicks that we've taken out. And we have another 19 ready to go this year. And that's kind of like a rolling program. So every year as the old ones get released, the new ones come in and then we start the whole process all over again, which is, uh, it's a nice project. And um, it's something that um, probably a lot of countries could look at if they have a particular bird that is on the brink. And I'm told by the World Parrot Trust, because this, I'd never get my head out of Belize. So I'm told by the World Parrot Trust that it's actually quite a, a unique program and nobody else seems to be doing it that way. So um, that was purely accidental. We didn't set out to do anything like that. But again, like now we've established the protocols, it would be quite nice to pass that on to other countries. Next slide, Mike. 
<clears throat> so Belize Bird Rescue, what is it? Where is it? Why is it? Um, like I said, Jerry and I, my, my partner Jerry and I were in Trinidad and we were looking for somewhere else to be um, for various reasons. No offense to Trinidad, but we had to move on. Uh, and we found this lovely English speaking country with great forests and everything. And we thought, this is great. We'll build a nice house. We'll retire eventually. And this will be a nice place to put down roots. And then we found two baby parrots that were in a bucket being sold by a poacher. And we bought them not realizing that this was a problem or illegal or any of those things. And we raised the birds to freedom because that's what we wanted the end result to, to be. And then more people were bringing us birds when they saw what we were doing, they'd say, oh, well, I've got a parrot and I don't want it anymore. And we're like, well, it's clipped and it's crying like a baby and it's like barking like a dog and that's not at all the same thing. But um, we ended up establishing uh, a program whereby we could, um, I wouldn't either teach these birds or get them into a position where they could learn to interact with the wild birds and then eventually be released. And we went to the forest department and said, this is absolutely nuts. Everybody has parrots in cages. Why is that? You know, you, your law says you're not allowed to have them and yet they're all over the place. And they said, pretty much, we can't confiscate, we can't enforce our laws because we have nowhere to put them. So that's where we started and totally unintentional. And we've had a very steep learning curve and made a bunch of mistakes. But here we are 18 years later with a process that we think works. Well, we know it works because we can prove it works. Um, and this is our facility that's grown over those 18 years out of necessity and um, 50 acres of beautiful forest. We're incredibly lucky to have that. And uh, the clinic and the quarantine facilities, the flight aviaries and all the enclosures that go with it that have grown with out of necessity. Next slide. <clears throat> So our ongoing programs that we have, um, we've, with, like I say, we started off with the rehab and rewilding of the ex-captive parrots out of complete necessity and have developed that program um, through uh, the process of bringing them in and um, checking them over and pushing them through the process. I actually talk a little bit more about the actual process of that later on. Um, the rehab of injured indigenous and migratory birds, that's kind of the, the standard that most centers do. You get a wild bird in, it's broken or it's injured or it's down or it's fallen from the nest or something. And you raise it to a point where it can be released and you release it back again. And that's a pretty well established uh, program and a core part of what we do, particularly from April to September in those, those breeding seasons and migration seasons. And the assisted hand rearing of the at-risk at yellowheads, that, that's a big time suck. This was one of our biggest uh, flocks that you can see right there. There's three interns there trying to keep these birds fed as fast as possible. That's a, a weaning process. When we finished um, weaning them in the crates when they can't fly, as soon as they fledge, they go into smaller enclosures where we can just like pump food into them as fast as we possibly can. These birds jump all over you, they scratch your face, scratch your arms. And so we have to train them to sit on one perch. If you're not on that perch, you don't get fed. And they learn that pretty quickly. And then we, as fast as we can, we move them into our huge flight aviary in the bush that's isolated completely from humans because these guys are pristine. They came to us with no habits whatsoever. And if we make them talk or, Give them any bad habits that's down to us that's all on us and that makes us look extremely bad so we want to move them through as fast as possible and they're the ones that sit for uh, like eight months till the following season and then off they go back out into the wild again um, back into the reserve this is where they came from um, the ex-captive yellowheads that we raise do not get released down there because they nearly always have some residual vocalizations that are inappropriate so we have to keep them away from our pristine babies. <laughs> um, like I said before, the facilitation of um, government enforcement and the captive wildlife program, which um, I actually have a slide on that later on, and that's a core part of what we do as well, which has been integral in bringing a halt to the poaching and the pet trade, or it's sort of not a halt, I wish we had, but like drawn a line so that we have somewhere to, to go from, from there. So, uh, and a sanctuary for non-releasable birds. I, you probably have exactly the same problem in um, Trinidad and wherever country you are in that has people bringing in non-indigenous or captive bred birds that cannot be released. You've got to put them somewhere. 
Um, we find here what people do, they bring them to Belize and this is it, this is gonna be the best place ever they've ever lived for the rest of our lives. And uh, they have all these wonderful tests done in the US for their birds to bring them down for West Nile and Cysteine Beacon Feather, get them to Belize, decide Belize isn't for them and then they can't take the bird back again because there's no way to do those tests here and the US won't accept the tests that we can do. And it doesn't matter how many times you tell people, if you bring a bird here, it's a one-way trip. They just don't listen or don't believe me. And we now have quite a few non-releasable birds that are not native to Belize. Um, next slide. <laughs> so where do the birds come from? Well, that was one route from people who think that they're gonna live in Belize for the rest of their lives and they bring us non-releasable birds. Um, confiscations from the forest department. So. Thanks to the facility that we've provided, they can now actually enforce the Wildlife Act, which forever has said you can't touch, keep, molest, catch um, any bird, egg, part, anything. And that includes actually all wildlife, apart from like a handful of species that you need a permit to hunt. But for the most part, all wildlife is strictly protected and all protected areas are protected. So we've actually got a good infrastructure to conserve and preserve our wildlife. It's just a question of enforcement. Um, we get um, a lot of what we call escape pets. The first one we have we call Paddington because he just turned up at the rescue. He must have heard the kerfuffle of all the other birds and he turned up with semi-clipped wings. He managed to get so far. And I swear he must have walked up the stairs and jumped on one of our um, rolling cages that we have with some birds outside. And he was just helping himself to the food through the bars and we're like, Hey, where'd you come from? <laughs> and that was quite a shock, but now we see it on a regular basis. And it always seems, the timing always seems to be around the point when their wing clipping from the previous year will have grown back. So we're talking April, May, June, July. Um, these, these birds just suddenly start turning up. We know that they're not ours because we banned every single one of our birds. We put a little ring on the, on the foot and it has a unique number so we can follow them on our database and everything. So when these birds turn up, that have clearly been pets and they don't have a ring. It's not one from our center, so Paddington two, three, and so on. That, uh, that little guy, I have to tell you, that's dynamite. He turned up on one of our feeders with a horrible injury on his face and he was spotted by one of our guests at the time. And we managed to catch him and he actually allowed himself to be caught. So he must have been in a hell of a state. And uh, we did a little bit of work on the beak, trimmed it down, filed it down, gave him lots of medications and painkillers and stuff. And he was super, super wild. We had him in a cage and he'd bounce from wire to wire to wire. And we're like, ah, you know what? He's eating, he looks okay, he looks happy. So after it, almost a year, we thought, let's try it, we'll release him. And he's doing great. He hangs out with all the others and, um, he's got a mate now. He comes in probably twice a week for food so we can keep track of him. And it just reinforces what I say, never say never. These animals adapt. They, they suffer these injuries in the wild and they'll still get by. So we shouldn't ever be judgmental and say, uh oh, not perfect, can't release him. I've learned that a lot. You know, you get the purists that say, nope, has to be 100% perfect. With some species, I agree. With others, not so much. Ah, I've lost my slide. <laughs> Um, so we, we, we were uh, escape pets, yes, surrenders. Surrenders, we're finding that the surrenders are becoming more and more prevalent. When we first started, we were looking at what we call friendly pers uh, persuasion, persuaded surrenders, which is where we kind of just stood over people and said, give it up, give up the bird. <laughs> You're behaving horribly with it. Um, and now more and more people are coming to us with the bird and saying, you know, we realize we made a mistake. This is not the right thing not the right situation for a particular bird. So we're handing him in for rehab. That, I'm gonna to point to that slide right now. That yellowing there is showing a typical diet deficiency. That bird's been deficient probably in a whole bunch of vitamins, probably fed tortillas and corn and probably peanuts and sunflower seeds. That's the standard here. And the yellow, the feathers are the first thing that gives. The body says, okay, like we're gonna to pull to the core processes and the feathers can wait. Um, Along with that, we often get blindness and with the blindness comes facial tumors and then so the process escalates. When we get them like that, we can usually turn it around, um, but sometimes the blindness is permanent and we're done. We have like six or seven birds that have eye, eye issues that we can't release, which is a real shame. 
Um, and then finally, the orphaned, injured or imperiled birds uh, due to human wildlife conflict, the usual car strikes, window strikes, um, mischief, mischievous kids with their slingshots and um, all those awful situations that birds encounter on their journeys around the world. Um, next slide. So our, um, our standards are, oh man, that's a stigion, yeah. Our standards are, um, we started with our own standards because we didn't know there was anything else. And then we discovered the IWRC and NWRA with their protocols, which helped us a lot to kind of verbalize what it was we already instinctively knew. And um, so we, we've incorporated quite a few of those into our agreements with the government that we will abide to those standards. And so we've done training courses with those various organizations. The wildlife database uh, is an extremely useful tool and it gives the government viewing access so they can see what we're doing at any moment in time. They can look at what's come in, what's died, unfortunately, what we've released, what situation we're at, how many patients we have. A fantastic resource. Um, we do as much continuing education with ourselves, with our interns, and with the forest department whenever they need training, particularly on the captive wildlife program and handling. Handling of parrots is quite a skill. Some of those birds can really bite, <laughs> I'm sure you guys know. Um, and we get visiting international rehabbers that love to come here because they don't get to work with parrots. It's, uh, it's one of those species that unless you're like in California or, and some of the southern states where they have got wild parrots now, you very rarely get to work with them and even less likely to get to work with them for release. So that's a, a good string to their bow to come down and get that kind of experience. We'll encourage as many visiting vets as possible, avian vets that it's not just like general vets, but avian vets to come and pass on any knowledge that they have. Things are changing all the time. There's new, um, new research into various drugs and the effects on the birds, particularly uh, bird metabolism. I always tell our interns when they first arrive, you know, think how often a mammal poops and how often a bird poops. And that's the difference in the metabolism. A bird can go every half an hour and we'd never get anything done if that was the case for mammals. But um, and that just shows the speed of the metab metabolism. So we have to pump so many more drugs into them. I remember telling our, um, our friends that run the monkey rehab, a dose for a bird that they had, a dose of meloxicam, which is a, um, a pain-killing kind of uh, anti-inflammatory. And I told him the dose and he was like, what, are you trying to kill it? <laughs> like, cause he'd have put like a 10th of that into a monkey and I'm putting that into a, a tiny bird. So um, yeah, and we have a very excellent um, expert network. We've developed so much, so many relationships with various centers and um, uh, research centers and vet hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. So we can just go online and I can send slides of things I'm seeing under the microscope and everything. It's a fantastic resource. And that gentleman there is Dr. Philip DeShield, who is our local avian vet who does all of our bird work. He's, he's in Belize City, fantastic guy. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I was talking about the rewilding. Um, so we, we get them at various stages. If we get them when they're teeny tiny chicks and they've just come to us and they've not gone through anybody else's hands, then that's wonderful because we can hand raise them the way we do the at-risk yellowhead parrots from pristine to flighted. And we know they're not clipped and we know they're not gonna get stress bars, which is, um, a condition that affects the, um, the feathers if they have any form of stress during the developmental process. And that stress can be lack of food or being removed from the nest and transported in a poor way or a prolonged period of being exposed to predation or um, just being generally hungry. And it makes a, a line across the feathers that's actually a weak point. My friend described it as a printer running out of ink. At one stage, there's no ink there. You know, you've seen those lines when your ink's going. And it makes a weak point. So when they do start to flap, the feathers actually break off at that point, which means that we have to wait a whole year for that to all go back again, at least, if not longer. Um, so that, along with wing clipping, is a massive challenge to us when they come in. So that can put the bird back 18 months. It's very unfortunate. Um, we find some species are much, much easier to rehab and release than others, like the smaller birds, the parakeets, they're very instinctive, very snappy, 
you know, angry little things that we raise and they're pretty much gone, particularly if they can fly from the nest, you know, that's great. Um, but the older ones, like the yellowheads, if they get imprinted at all uh, in human hands as a pet, our longest group, we had a, that group, a group of 28, and our longest period there was nine years for rehabbing those. So it's, it's a commitment. And, and like I said, I, I try to say never say never. And for the most point, I've never said never. We've got a couple of birds that uh, I don't see it. I don't see it. They're not changing. They're completely nuts. They hate humans. And, and that's a problem too. If they love humans, they'll go to humans. They hate humans, they'll go to humans to rip their face off. So um, it has to be right down the middle, completely bonded to their, their flock and um, happy to go off and forage and be parrots and not try and find houses and homes and people. Um, our parrots, including the yellowheads, have been observed to be breeding. So all of these guys, you can see that this little foot here has a band. I'm pointing to my screen like you can see it. No idea. Um, the little foot has a band, like I said, with a unique number on it. And we know when two banded birds turn up, with an unbanded bird, that's probably one of their babies that they've had in the wild. And, and that to us is an amazing thing. That's a, a real vindication that our program works and we're doing the right thing. And apparently the rangers now in the, res the reserve where we release the baby yellowheads are seeing our birds breeding together and our birds breeding with the wild birds as well. So they're completely integrating and it's working fantastic. So, and when we first started, we were told it can't be done. You can't put a parrot back in the wild when it's been a human hound. So we proved them wrong. And even the older parrots, the ones that come in with a whole bunch of character vocalizations and behaviors, given enough time, they can go. They can go back into the wild. They may have quirks. And <laughs> my, my favorite is a couple of red lords that we released God knows how long ago. And they fly over the house pretty much every evening. And if they see me, they'll give a wolf whistle. But they'll just keep going. So I know it's them and I'm like, hi guys, well done. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Makes me feel good. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, um, we definitely have learned an awful lot. We've made a lot of mistakes and we are happy to pass on the mistakes as well as the triumphs because I think everybody can learn from all of those things. Um, and next slide, sorry. <laughs> So this, the captive registrar, captive parrot registration program. So that started because we were, we were working with the forest department on enforcement and we were going from house to house and they were being selective about who they would enforce the law with. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna use that, well, I am gonna use the C word. There's a level of corruption in, and I think there's a level of corruption in every government, in every part of the world. So, and particularly in Belize, and it's not exactly corruption, it's, it's the friend network. Because when we first came here, there were only 200,000 people. So everybody knew everybody, and most people were related to everybody. So when the forest department turned up at somebody's house, they're like, oh, it's my cousin's sister's uncle's auntie's friend, so I can't touch them. And we said, you know, honestly, you can't keep using us like this. You can't be selective about what you're doing. You either enforce this or you don't. Um, so we devised this captive registration program and it's this big fix it binder with all the parameters in it that we were lucky enough to be asked to write. So that was a huge um, like vindication of what we do as well as, um, as, as an appreciation of our knowledge. So our first, my very first pro priority was that this bird had to be hand tame because if it's not hand tame, it's a wild bird in a cage and it needs to be released. It had to be in physically good condition, or at least in condition that could be made into good condition given the right instruction to the person. And the minimum care standards had a certain size of cage, a certain amount of perching, food, shelter, sun, um, roost boxes, not nest boxes, but roost boxes, which is a little three-sided box that they like to sleep in and makes them feel safe and secure, and toys and enrichment. And um, they had to comply with that before they were given the license and had their leg band fitted to the bird, which had a registration number on it. If the bird passed away, then they weren't allowed to get another one. If they wanted to pass the bird on to somebody else, they had to contact the forest department and the bird was tracked right through. 
Um, the initial registration ended in 2016, after which everything was subject to confiscation. If a new bird came into the, the, the pet program, the pet trade, we knew it was unregistered, it was newly poached, and it was coming out of the, the pet trade straight away. We've had a bit of a hiccup and COVID didn't help, but we're back on track now, which is good to know. That young lady on the far right there, that's Miss Victoria. She's our wildlife officer who helped us devise a program. And she's back in charge and we're starting back up again. But what we found was that people were, they were really proud of what they, you know, that they had this bird. And a lot of these birds had conditions where they couldn't be released anyway. So we were kind of grateful that the people were looking after that. It was almost like a foster program. And so it gave them a sense of pride. And on top of that, you know, people, <laughs> what we found were people were, were a British phrase, they were dobbing in their neighbors. They were like, ah, oh, well, why are you taking my bird when she has four and she has two and she's got seven toucans. And we found that we could infiltrate really easily there and clean up as it were. So that was actually a, a big success in that regard. And we've got a couple of countries looking at what we did and asking us, you know, if it could be translated to them as well, which is, great news because the last thing any rescue center wants is everybody's tame parrot coming in at once to be released it's not it's not going to ever going to be a practical solution and this was a great way to to phase in um random uh, sorry mandatory confiscations so um next slide yeah we put media and enforcement together because they go hand in hand you can't you can't enforce unless people know you're going to do it. Like I said, we had, um, oh my gosh, what, a hundred years of no enforcement whatsoever. Um, probably 30 years of Belizean um, government non-enforcement due to lack of anywhere to put it. We have a zoo here and it's a fabulous zoo, um, but they're, they're at capacity with birds pretty much all the time. And the last thing that they have is room for all these crazy captive parrots that probably can't even all go into the same cage together and need individual cages and a lot of introduction and a lot of work. So um, the enforcement was super important, but we had to inform people that this was happening and don't go out and get a parrot because you are gonna have it confiscated. What we've got here in Belize is that with a small country, we have two national newspapers, two or three TV and radio stations, and that's pretty much it. And there's like 500 schools and they all have um, a central pigeonhole system. So if we wanted to reach each school, we could print 500 or something, roll it up, stick it in the pigeonhole system, and every school will get that brochure or poster or outreach pack or whatever it is. We have, um, I would say four or five major outreach events a year, which we will attend with our table of um, leaflets and all our outreach information. And it's super easy to spread the news here which uh, works in our favor, no end. That lovely uh, billboard that we've got there is on the busiest junction in Belmapan. We just put it up this last month. An Audubon Society give us the site for free, so that, which is an absolutely fantastic gift, actually. It saves us a fortune all year. And it has massive impact and all the birds around it are fluorescent, you know, reflect in the night as well. Um, and that's got a lot of people talking. We're also running a competition around guess the species of the birds or work out the species of the birds, which is also generating more social media traffic and um, interest in birds in general with our young birders. So generally speaking, the enforcement's improved. Um, since we've been here, we're not seeing anywhere near the number of captive parrots in cages. When it does happen, we get probably get two or three reports for every single parrot that suddenly appears in captivity. So people are aware, youngsters are not particularly interested in keeping birds as pets anymore. They're more interested in nature, conservation, birding. Tide is definitely turning and it's fabulous to watch, it really is. And it makes our job easier and much more rewarding than just papering over the cracks, which was what we were doing for a long time in the beginning. So yeah, completely very, very encouraging and um, um, long may it continue, <laughs> that's what I can say. And I actually, I know that Mark and his team are hoping to enforce, uh, to implement something along these lines in Trinidad and I wish them every success and it's totally worth it. So, and that kind of wraps up what I have to say at the moment, Mark. All right, thank you so much, Nikki.
right. And um, we'll now be opening the floor to discussion and Q&A. Uh, Mark, can you keep an eye on the question and answer section? Sure, I will. I will do. All right, let me just move that to the side. Nikki, maybe one question just to kick this yeah. off. I'm I'm pretty fascinated by the the potential for rehabbing older parents. Uh, I'm wondering if you have some additional insights to share on this. That um, oh. for, for a little context, that maybe you hear it in Belize, but a lot of times uh, people will feel that uh, they'll see someone selling a parrot and, and it's a baby. And it's this helpless thing that needs immediate intervention to stay alive. But then they feel that because it's been hand reared that they'll never be able to get this animal rehabilitated. There's no option. It's just a household pet from now on. It, what's your perspective on that? You, it seems like you are rehabilitating older animals. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think. I probably, um, we had a yellow head um, called Patty and she was, I'm pretty sure she was 10 or 11 when we got her. And she had some horrible human habits. Um, her diet was terrible and vocalization, et cetera, et cetera. She was one of that group of 28 that was released after a total of like nine years. We were throwing birds in slowly throughout that nine years, but I think she was at the beginning. So she was a nine year rehab case. So she was 19 when she went out, but that means she's, she's still within breeding age and it's still a lot better than leaving her in a cage. So we're saying given the time, given the right circumstances, given enough of her, their own species around, they forget to be involved with humans. That wild instinct is, is all right there under the surface. And I keep saying this to people, these are not domesticated animals. Somebody will use the word domesticated and I'm like, no, these are not. They're just like, they've only been taken from the wild and stuck in a cage. Not only that, they've been taken from a wild, stuck in a cage within the wild. So for us, it's even easier because they've not lost those triggers, the, the weather triggers and the, the hormones and the noises and the birds around them. It's all right there in the undercurrent and you just need to give them the right circumstances to, to bring all that back to, to the forefront. And let's face it, I mean, anybody who has a captive parrot knows that like right about now, actually, they're going to start humping everything that, that they like um, and biting everything they don't like that turns them into these horrible, humpy, bitey monsters. And it, it makes them very unpleasant pets. And that's kind of about the time when people start handing in their birds, saying it doesn't like my husband and I can't cope with it in the house. And sure, this bird eats pizza and it, it sings Happy Christmas and it's like a, a complete, you know... <laughs> I can't think of a polite word <laughs> we use the something show you know and and but they do turn around they absolutely do just needs time we lost mark again <laughs> i'm here oh you're well, okay. <laughs> you with us yeah you me? um Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the question, please don't think there's anything like a stupid question because I rattled through this and I'm not sure which parts I missed out. And the things that are to me are obvious because I deal with them day in, day out. You might be thinking, well, how does that work? Or how does she do that? Or why do they do that? So please ask because there's probably other people thinking the same thing. Um, here's, here's a question I'm getting. I think this is relevant for the Trinidad context, especially since the, the idea of rehabilitation is, is uh, there's, like I said, there's some great capacity here, but it's not immense. It's kind of early yeah. and you don't see a lot of government involvement. What sort of response did you get from the government in the beginning? Were they immediately very supportive? Did you kind of have to sell them on the idea? Um, actually, no, I mean, because uh, when we went to them and said, why aren't you enforcing the law? Um, because, I, okay, let's backtrack a little bit. When we kept finding these people were bringing us birds and everything, I produced this little leaflet that I printed off on my home printer. And I was handing out to everybody that had a bird in captivity. And everybody was really aggressive. And I thought, why are they aggressive with this 
horrible white woman coming in and telling them they can't have a parrot. Why on earth would they be across that route? Um, so I went to the forest department, we went to the forest department and said, you know, why, why is this happening? And they said, because we have nowhere to put these birds. So they were actually quite pleased that they could enforce the law on, in general. But like I said, they were selective about it. If somebody had connections or friends or even money, dare I say, they were okay, but you know they could go off into the villages and pick out all these birds and bring them to us. Um, so in the first instance, they were happy because they could get their tick in the box, mm -hmm. but um, we had to come to an agreement that it became across the board rather than selective. And, and oh, and plus, you know, never mind the parrot situation. At that point, we uh, we found out the forest department would be somebody would take in an owl that they found on the floor, which we know probably was not in any problems at all. But anyway, they stick it in a box, take it to the forest department. Forest department look at it and go, hmm, don't know what to do with that. So they put it in a corner and forget about it. And then somebody opens the box when it starts to smell. So that stopped as well. That was great. That gave them somewhere. They pick up the phone and say, hey, we've got an owl and we come pick it up. And that was another great thing about accidentally, um, fortuitously buying a property four, four miles down the road from the forest department, we could pop in and out all the time. So location for us was fantastic. Great, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, one on Q&A here. Uh, let's see, what's the ratio of indigenous to non-indigenous birds at the center? Oh gosh, um, I wouldn't even be able to put that in the percentage. We probably got, what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've had like eight or nine non-indigenous birds end up here and we've managed to put a couple out to other places, um, to families, you know. Um, but then we've had like over, over a thousand parrots come through here. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a concern, it's just, another one of those factors and they are a resource suck too we have two macaws in one of our giant aviaries and they're like they're just there and they're gorgeous and everything but i can't put them anywhere else because it sends the wrong message if i, I yeah i find like a resort or somebody who's got the resources to build a great cage for these birds what kind of message are we sending that it's okay to put birds in a cage which is something we've been fighting against for the last 18 19 years yeah so, yeah yeah, that's, that's um, really just a quick um, note mm -hmm. for those who are watching on Facebook, you can feel free to drop your questions there as well, and we can answer them live for you now. Great point. Yes. <laughs> here's, here's one I've got on direct message from a friendly person who likes to stay anonymous. Um, but they are saying a lot of people who have pet parrots really do love them. Mm -hmm. uh, but other people don't really look after them. And it's kind of these different types of owners. How yeah. do these people react to suddenly having to meet care requirements? The, I guess he, uh, the, there was the permitting process and there's a standard mm -hmm. of care that was required. What was, what was the public response? Um, it was, you know, that, that was a, is a really, really good question because we had to come up with a standard that one size fits all. Um, well, actually two sizes fits all for the small birds and the bigger birds. And we know that there are people who have birds who are not flighted, that live in the house with them, sit on their shoulders, sleep on the curtain rail, and they don't need a cage. Um, and the problem we had with the forest department was using your common sense. And they don't have the knowledge that we have. They don't work with these birds all day and every day. They don't get the process. So I, I think we're slowly getting through to them that they've got to use their common sense with that. Um, most people were receptive when we showed them that how the bird could be and how you could go into an aviary uh, and give your bird a bath in the rain without him flying off, how you could um, give them some space to swing and play and everything. I think people were generally receptive. And alongside that, we gave a whole bunch more information on diet and health and hazards in the home. Because, you know, it's not until your door slams on your bird's leg because they're sitting on the top of the door that you think, oh, probably shouldn't have done that. And, you, but if you point all that out beforehand, <laughs> that's always good knowledge to have. So I think by and large, it was, it was, they were, it was well received. Plus the fact, don't forget, it is illegal to have them. 
So this was a privilege afforded to people. Um, and if you wanted that bird, you had to abide by that privilege, uh, by the rules that came with it. So it was kind of a give and take. Mm. That's, that's interesting. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm guessing there still are people who have parrots who were part of that amnesty program since yeah. they lived for a long time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I hope. I mean, that, that's something that I want to do further down the line is just pick up the phone and say, hey, how's your bird? How's it going? How did it work out for you? And actually get some feedback on whether or not what we implemented was, was useful to them or whether they built the cage as somebody did, built the cage, got all their permits, put the bird back in the stupid little cage and then put chickens in there because it was a much better chicken coop than they had. <laughs> so um, again, we're back to enforcement and resources to go around and keep checking on the situation. So, but yeah, it would be an interesting, um, maybe a, a student to come down and do some follow-up further in the year, in the years. Great. Uh, here's a question. I know we've got uh, some vet students with us. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a question about, is there, much difference in how you re rehab one parrot species to the next. Do you see a lot of differentiation in what their, their needs are? Uh, yes and no. Um, we, we always keep the species separate. I don't think I actually made that clear because you don't want one species bonding to another different species because they'll have nowhere to live. That neither flock will accept that weird couple. Um, the... Oh man, what can I say? The parakeets actually, that we've got one parakeet is the olive throated parakeet. And those actually can be really nasty to each other. So we have to kind of watch the, the dynamics in certainly after introductions and coming up to breeding season, they can, they can be pretty evil, like pull tails out and bite heads and things. Um, I would say not, it's, um, it's more a question of the stage of the birds. So for instance, if they're really badly clipped on their wings, if the feathers are clipped, I can't put them into big aviaries because I don't want them climbing high, high, high and then trying to fly and then they'll hit the ground and cause themselves some damage. So we keep groups of similar condition birds together and then move them up through the program into bigger and bigger aviaries until they're fully flighted and then they release. And the same with, um, habituation, the last thing we want to do is take a, a bird that's perhaps singing happy birthday day in, day out, stick him with some birds that haven't got any vocalization, pretty soon you've got yourself a chorus. Um, and that's actually not productive either. So that, that, that's a consideration, and especially with the yellowheads. I try and keep the talkers away from the ones who aren't talking. Great. Great. Lauren, we've got a few other questions here in the queue. Do you want to, do you want to pick one out? All right. Um, well, just uh, in the trend of vet students, how would a vet student from Trinidad and Tobago be able to connect with your center for volunteering or internships? Right. Well, we do, I had. I would be able to do a perfectly normal rattly off spiel until COVID hit, <laughs> and, and like everybody else, you know, the, the country went into all kinds of lockdowns and rules and regulations and border border controls and everything. I think we're coming out of that. I think everybody's coming out of that. So um, if you go to our website, there is a page for interning and take a look at that and um, maybe um, drop me a line. Um, and I'm thinking of opening back up the program again. I don't know if I'll get it for this year though, but from next year onwards, I should be able to start receiving vet students. We don't take too many at the time because we don't want to, I don't want people here just for the sake of being here. They need to get a good experience and get a lot of hands on and be immersed and um, take a level of responsibility for what they're doing. And what we do is kind of unique because not many places allow um, students to, um, to, to do the intubation of the birds, you know, the tube feeding where you put the tube down the throat and everything. But we work with people until we're com confident that they can cope with that. So that's a massive skill for somebody else to take away. Um, so yeah, go to the website and check out the intern page and see what you think. And also it, there is a, there's a fee for it because we have to cover our costs of accommodation and food, but, um, 
if we're looking at somebody who might take something back to a rehab center to do a similar kind of thing, then we, we may have an exchange program that we can work on. All right, thank you. And another question following on from that, mm -hmm. what resources would you recommend to a rehab center to grow in a small country like Belize or Trinidad and Tobago? Ew. But you know what, I think the first thing I would recommend they do is get in touch with the IWRC because they send trainers down. If they have a, a new rehab center that's got like five or 10 people, they will send somebody down to do their wildlife rehab course, which is, a, it's, it's basic, but it's, it's worth doing. They're actually doing it online at the moment. So that might even be a better option for a lot of people. I did the online course last year just to do the course and it was it was great it worked fine online so I would recommend starting with that okay. and then from there they can give you um, all the basic equipment and materials that you might need and honestly from there on in it's a question of growing with whatever species comes in if you're going to try and start and say right I mean that was the beauty of what Jerry and I did because we landed up with absolutely no preconceived ideas and no intentions to start in a, a rehab center so we got parrots, we learned how to work with parrots, we built what we needed for parrots, then we got owls, then we got pelicans, and then toucans, and so it went on. And every species that came in, we're like, okay, so what do we need to do? What do we need to get? How do we need to set this up? And the place grew. And I would recommend that. And the biggest, biggest, biggest thing is funding. We get no funding from the government, never have. Um, initially, Jerry was working and he would put all his resources into our home, the accommodation that became the rescue center. And over the years, it's become self-sufficient and we've become an NGO and a 501 and all the other things. So I would recommend starting not where we did, but start at the NGO nonprofit 501c3 if you can, because most of your funding will come from the US. All right. And Tom. Um... I think we're actually just about slightly over time. Um, so this is the last opportunity for <laughs> questions. If you've got any more questions, please ask them now. Uh, oh yes, and we are seeing a question here. Do birds thrive in homes with domestic animals? Is that a good situation for them? Oh, that's, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't trust any domestic animal around a bird. I wouldn't, I see these videos and it makes me cringe when you see a dog with a parrot. And I'm like, just, you know, that dog just have a bad day and he's taking the parrot's head off. So if you can keep the two separate, if you can give the parrot elevation, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about parrots more than anything else. And it's just, ugh, I don't know. It's, it's like kids and domestic animals, you know, you can never leave them alone together. All right. Yes. <laughs> uh, and that is possibly our final question for the evening. Okay. Thank you so much, Nikki, for okay. speaking with us today. It's been really in very interesting and enlightening. And oh. just to, it's great to hear about all the work being done in another small country and how far you guys have come. We have a lot of great wildlife rehabbers here in Trinidad and Tobago as well, who I'm sure will have really appreciated listening to your talk today. Wonderful. I would encourage you to get together. It's a very egotistical um, world, the rehab world. I don't know why, it just is. And um, there <laughs> seems to be a lot of competition between centers. Really do urge you to cooperate, um, specialize. So one of you do the water birds, one of you do the forest birds, you know, um, and that way you're you're not that you're not splitting all your resources. You know, work together, uh, develop together, grow together, and and find your strengths. That's what I'd say. That's a great point, and I I am back. My internet yeah. <laughs> does not want me to stick around for very long at a time. But th thank you so much, Nikki. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I think I'll I'll Lauren I'll. I'll I'll ask uh, in Nikki's stead, next slide, just so we can share for people uh, some of the contacts. Uh, so for people who want to check out Belize Bird Rescue, they're on Facebook, Instagram, and on web. Uh, anyone so inspired who'd like to donate to Belize Bird Rescue, they have a very easy donation opportunity. I'll say it for you, Nikki, don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> 
And, yeah. uh, thank you so much. This, is, this has been a pleasure having you. Thank you so much to, uh, for having me here. It's great. Thanks. Oh, and finally, if anyone had questions that we were unable to get to, or if you come up with any questions after viewing this webinar, feel free to reach out to us at Nurture Nature. Um, you can contact us at our Facebook or Instagram, or even our email and website.